Good evening, everyone. You hear that sound in the background? That... Yeah, you may have heard that in the background of a few of my videos recently, actually. That is the sound of this computer right here. Um, it is a massive Mac, iMac. It's beautiful in every way. However, there is some problem either with the temperature gauge or something inside it that causes the fan to run whenever it's on. Which means that for the past year, every time I've turned on my computer, I've been hit by this noise wall. And it is loud, believe me, you notice when it's off. So tomorrow, we're finally taking it in, or rather my family's taking it in to get repaired. So that was completely uninteresting to any of you who clicked on this based on the title. So let me get straight to it. Songwriting and the art of melody placement. Um, melody placement is quite important with the song. It helps give you structure. It helps give you an idea of where you're going. I mean, with a lot of things, take chess, for example. The greatest players, they don't think in individual moves. They think in movement chains. Likewise, with songwriting, what you want to do is think in terms of, in ways that help, um, like, break down the song into manageable chunks, but connected chunks. You don't want a disjointed note-by-note -note melody. That's kind of how you get Rebecca Black's Friday. No offense. Um, so what you want is a uh, sort of coherent plan, a general plan, an idea, especially if you're trying to write something relatively quickly, which you probably want to do. Um, based on, I don't know, how people improve. Um, uh, this is anecdotal in that I heard it on another YouTube lecture and you get to look it up, and it wasn't in Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, although that deals with other examples. But there was some professor of pottery who said, half the class, you know, make the perfect pot and you'll be graded on that this semester. And to the other class, he said, other half, he said, you'll be graded by weight. So an A is 50 kilograms worth of pots, B is 40 kilograms, and I don't care about the quality of the pots. And then at the end of the semester, independent observers were brought in and they found that the people who had just made masses of pots by weight had some pieces that were better, of better quality than the ones who labored all semester long over the perfect pot because you get better by doing things and making mistakes. So, you know, if you're aiming to get, become a good songwriter, what you want to do is make things quickly and develop your fluency. Um, so, melody lines. What do I mean by that? Well, obviously, if you're writing your standard um, pop song, whatever, or anything with a chorus, you want the chorus to pop. You want the chorus to soar. What you want is the chorus is for the chorus to be in a different place to where your verse is. It helps signal to the ear that something else is going on. In some choruses, you know, you can do the counterintuitive thing and have it lower than the, you know, um, verse or whatever, but. Generally speaking, you want the chorus to be higher, placed higher in the vocal range than the verse, because the verse is where you do a lot of the storytelling. It's, you know, if you put it in a more intimate range, lower range of the voice, it's easier to communicate, less belt, which is, you know, great to hear, but not so hard, easy to understand, and, you know, it enables you to do that communication thing. Then by the leading, you hit the chorus, it's that high part, and you just pump it, and it doesn't really matter how well people hear you, because if the chorus is well written enough, and well simple enough, as choruses should be, then people will get the, you know, really latch onto it. And that's what you know, helps, that's the build-up to the apex of the chorus, helps make a good song. So, let's do an example. Um, uh, what's a good example? Um, well, you know say, Why the Shade of Pale, although... We skipped the lap and dango And two car wheels across the floor I was feeling kind of seasick But the crowd called out for more You note how the highest note in that verse is Ah, oh, ba 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 we skipped the light fandango and two covers across the floor. I was feeling kind of seasick, but the crowd called out for. So from seasick to there is basically where the verse is. And then at the end, you go, When we called out for another drink, the waiter brought a tray, which is the line before the chorus. Note that's where it changes. 
That's where, like, the chords change. No. The room was humming harder as the ceiling flew away. That's a different subject. But the line before the chorus is where the melody goes into a different register. And that's a signal that something's going to happen. And then the chorus, you know, And so it was And later As the mirror told its tale That her face at first was ghostly Turned a white shade of pale You know, it hits that high note. And so it was And you look at people in pubs or restaurants who sing along with that song or, you know, they don't know the words or whatever but when that bit comes, they're like, yeah! You know what I mean? Um, uh, what's, a, what's another good example? Um, oh, Robbie Williams' Angels, if I recall correctly. don't remember the verses, but... Our love and angels instead And through it all She offers me protection And it's right up there Wherever it may take me You know? So you want to plan that out. How do you go about this? Well, there are some rough rules. Ooh rough guidelines. Here's what I do. For example, I just um, wrote a basic melody lyrics of, for a backing that uh, my brother's ended on a thing called Twitter Tuesdays, www.twittertuesdays.com. Um, he puts up a song there every so often, gets a guest artist to come in and write over the top of his backings. So um, I do a couple of these every so often, and recently I wrote one for this other singer, Kent, to um, sing over, or sing. And um, I, you know, I had a rough idea. I, Zen gave me instructions as to his general range, what notes to hit, um, and within that, I needed to plan a melody. And this is important if you're writing for other people. You know, you have to be able to plan a melody that works with that person's voice. You know, you can't just write for Beyonce off the bat. You've got to... Anyway, um, so what I did was uh, started off the track with... Um, it was in G minor, and I could go up to an F. So, la 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 la. Ideally, you, I've said this before, you want to keep a melody within the range of about an octave. But what I did is start rule number one. If anybody sees you, you don't know who I am. Ba da da ba 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 ba. So it's that fit. Ba 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 ba. And there's a bit of variation as it goes on to keep the ear interested, but basically, all of the notes happen within that fifth range. And then, in the lead-in, I go, All I want is you, girl! And that, the lead-in, happens a third up. Basically there. Basically, it all happens up there. It shifts it up, which, you know, gets you into a different mood. And then I shift the chorus back down to, well, basically three notes. But the beat is pumping, and it's really simple. You know, the ear has already been primed. On the cover, lover, on the cover with You know. And that's really easy to sing, really memorable. And... Yeah, that's how I planned out the melody. So I was like, right, okay, first bit, uh, start in the tonic, you know, the bottom note, and do something, okay, that works, that works, I do that, and then for the verse, let's hit the high note straight up. Not the verse, the lead-in. So for the lead-in, let's hit the high note straight up. That works. Do it again, and then repeat that bit. Da -da. On the cover, lover, on the cover. I'll post a link to the website down there so you can listen to the song. It's called, I think it's called Rules or Undercover Lover. I cannot remember. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's basically how I design a melody. Ideally, the verse is lower, the lead in is in the middle, and maybe the chorus goes back, but if I can, I put the chorus higher. So, what's, a, what's another good song? A good example of this is that song, My Little Prophecy, that I put up recently, that I was singing live at a YouTube thingy. Um, it starts... Again, it's in G. But, pay my little prophecy, 
my prophecy. What you want to do to me, do to me? Yeah, you're such a mystery, a mystery I don't know. Every day I try to get, you know, so. Basically there. That bit. Bass starting on the D. And then I go, and I wonder if this feeling means that I'm into you. So already I've introduced lower notes and higher notes to the melody. I've increased the range. And I wonder if I'm thinking about your destiny. And now, where's the chorus start? Oh, the highest note of what's come before. So, come on, come on, you're gonna be somebody big one day. Go on, go on, and find your extraordinary way. So in the universe of the melody, we're starting at the highest notes that we've hit thus far. And what happens in the third line of the chorus? Someday we'll meet again and we'll see what you have become. I hit the highest note that I hit in the whole song. Because that's the power moment. That's that's the bit that makes your ego wee, you know? But don't forget I want you, you were my special one. And then um yeah, if you listen to that, you might hear the harmonies in the background as well that also hit that note quite heavily, but they're behind the chorus. But it creates that feeling of energy because that note is pretty near the top of my full voice vocal range, which means that I hit it hard and with that ping that people like to hear. You know, that slightly dangerous edge tone that everybody wants. So you want to save that ideally for the chorus, which is, means putting the chorus higher relative to the verse, but not too much. Otherwise, you know, it just gets impossible to sing. I did that to a poor um, Emmy Poata. She, she, no, she did a great job, but like the verse for Do You Understand was like down there, and then the chorus started up there. Like, that is a big range. And then the bridge hit that note. So you've got two octaves in one song. It was nuts. And they had to all be hit with power. But, um, you know, she did a great job. Like, she nailed it. But um, that's kind of pushing it a little, unless you've got a decent singer. As you can tell, my face is getting flushed. It's a little hot in this room, and I've spoken for far too long already. Um, so I'll cut this here, and hopefully that gave you an idea. If you're going to take anything away from this, make it uh, just a simple general principle. Verse, low, start, it's like a launch pad, lead in, ignition, chorus, the moon, you know, launch it, and hit your big note in the chorus. Or in the bridge, but that's that's a different thing, you know, like bridges are, bridges are a different animal, we'll get into that sometime. But uh, basically, if you can construct a decent verse lead chorus melodic progression, um, the bridge is less important in terms of, you know, will people remember the song. So, yep, that's just something to think about. Hope you got something out of that. And remember, keep crafting great melodies. Catch you later. And, um, you know, the more you make, the better you get. So keep writing. See you later.